Coming up on this edition of The Climate Show, it's an all-new special with myself, John and Gareth. We're going to be looking at some extreme weather events over the past few weeks, including floods and forest fires, plus a new climate report out of Australia that says the fossil fuels have to stay in the ground. John Cook gets consensus, but he also gets controversial. And just a note about the first two minutes of this show, there's a little bit of an echo, but we get rid of that, so stick around. It's all coming up on this edition of The Climate Show. This episode of The Climate Show is brought to you by hot-topic.co.nz cyblogs.co.nz skepticalscience.com scoop.co.nz and idealog.co.nz But we're actually building up heat at a rate of four Hiroshima bombs worth of heat per second. What good is a drop in the ocean? Hi there and welcome along to The Climate Show, episode number 34. Back from the dead is The Climate Show, recording on this 24th day of June 2013. My name is Glenn Williams and uh, I'm at the helm here doing all the video switching here on this uh, live uh, Google Plus Hangout. But um, this climate show would be absolutely nothing. It would be void of any kind of information if we didn't have uh, my two co-hosts. Gareth Renaldon, first of all. Gareth, how are you? I'm very well, Glenn. How are you? <laughs> I'm good, and it's so lovely to um, see you because it's been quite a few um, months, really, uh, from episode number 33 to 34, but it's, uh, it's good to be reconnecting once again. <laughs> but um, moving on to um, John Cock um, from SkepticalScience.com. Good to see you once again, John. Welcome back to the show. Hey, Glenn. Good, good to finally be back again. Yeah, and, um, and, and you've been busy as well. Uh, in fact, uh, we'll, we'll talk about um, a whole lot of uh, stuff that you've been up to, but um, we're creating a bit of controversy over the past 48 hours there, John. Well, I, I guess you could call it that. It seems whenever um, I open my mouth these days, someone on the internet gets a bit cranky. <laughs> Hey, well, um, how this how this um, show is going to roll out is that because we haven't um, seen each other in a wee while and we haven't done a climate show in a wee while, it's um, a good opportunity to um, really uh, reconnect with the news and all the um, all the, the information that's been out there that um, we haven't had a chance to talk about on the show. Uh, we also have uh, an interview that, um, Gareth, who did you talk to a couple of weeks ago? Ah, well, I had the very great pleasure of talking to Bill McKibben, the uh, founder, of, well, the probably the best-known American environmentalist and um, climate activist who has been doing a tour of Australia and New Zealand. And it was a very great pleasure to catch up with Bill. Um, on his last tour uh, four or five years ago, I had the pleasure of sharing a, a stage with him one morning. So it was uh, good to catch up and to find out what he was on about, which was, of course, all about keeping coal in the hole, which is an important uh, important approach to solving a climate, any climate problem, particularly if you're talking to Australians. Absolutely. Well, we'll, we'll um, pop that interview and halfway through the show in between all the news um, that we've got to talk about. So let's um, let's dive on in first of all um, and uh, Gareth we're talking about uh, these recent floods uh, not only in Nepal but also Canada and uh, in Europe as well just last month. Yeah that's an amazing sequence of extreme weather because when we started the show notes for this show Glenn last week I actually put up um, a few extreme weather events <laughs> that uh, I thought would be relevant for a conversation that we were planning to have at the end of last week and I put up that we were going to talk about the Colorado fires uh, we were going to talk about the 110 billion cost of uh, last year's extreme weather events in the US we were going to talk about flooding in Germany and an amazing hailstorm that uh, did some very severe damage to the um, the the vine the vineyards of the Upper Loire Valley, particularly in Vouvray, and then in just the last sort of three or four days, really, um, we've had the flooding in Nepal, and the pictures of that have been um, absolutely incredible. There's, 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 the monsoon arrived early; um, it arrived in a particularly intense way, and it brought flooding and landslides um, throughout large parts of northern India uh, and the damage that's been done and the, the, the people I, I gather that the death toll is already um, over a thousand and there are 40 or 50,000 people still stranded 
um, in those parts of India. Uh, the pictures are just, you know, sickening to watch. Um, now, it has to be said, to be fair, that India does get monsoons. They rely on the monsoon rains. Um, and that, um, this might sound a bit cynical, but the number of people who die in flooding in India is actually much less than the death toll of a major drought. So mm -hmm. in the sense that the monsoon is essential to um, the, the sort of, the, the, the health of, of agriculture in India and the overall health of the nation, then the fact that it's arrived is a good thing. But it didn't need to arrive as, as um, intensely as it has done. And there are certainly people in, in India who are now believing that this is uh, rather like the floods in Pakistan a couple of years ago, um, a, a, a part of um, an intensification of the monsoon cycle that, that, that uh, goes sort of in hand with, with climate change. So when I, I started looking at what was happening in Nepal, and then within a day or so, we learned that Calgary, which is Canada's fourth largest city, is the oil capital. Um, in, in <laughs> interesting irony, you might say, yeah. uh, the oil capital of Canada has had remarkable flooding because of torrential rainfall. Um, in the catchments of the two rivers that, that flow through that city, the, the Elbow and the Bow, and the water levels, the, um, the home of the Calgary Stampede is completely flooded. Uh, it's uh, just an incredible sight to see a, a city. It's, it almost looks like Brisbane, John. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we had our turn a couple of years ago, and, and we've been lucky that it hasn't repeated since, but... But it doesn't seem like uh, much time passes before you see see these kind of extreme flood events happening somewhere in the world, and and just when you when you add it all together, just the uh, the curve of extreme weather events happening globally is is accelerating upwards. There's certainly um, a lot of water in the atmosphere. Wouldn't we agree with that, guys? Yeah, that's right, and a lot of that falls on you in London, Glenn. So. <laughs> A little too much, but we don't. Of course, we we haven't had these um, extreme flooding events um, like they did uh, in in Europe. Um, what are we talking about? The Czech Republic, Germany, a little bit of France as well. Am I missing anyone else there, Gareth? Yeah, it was Germany, the Czech Republic, Poland, Austria, uh, parts of Hungary, and basically as that water works its way down towards the Black Sea. So um, those floods have cost sent the central european economy um 22 billion um us dollars so far and they were in many cases at least a one in 500 year event um certainly one in 100 years and in some cases possibly unprecedented so we were looking at an in, again um extremely intense rainfall over the northern alps um the weather system was set up so that very uh, warm, moist air from the Mediterranean was being blown up over the Alps, meeting colder air on the other side and dumping just um, biblical quantities of rain on um, southern Germany and the Czech Republic. And the consequence was that water was rising throughout those regions and with enormous economic loss. Now, the other, the other part, of, the interesting part of that particular event is that it was the second time Mm. in um, the last sort of six or seven years that flooding of that scale has taken place in that part of the world. And I think it was the meteorologist and blogger Jeff Masters who said, you know, when a one in a 500 year event comes along, it's, it's, it's a notable event. But when two of them happen um, in the space of a decade, then you've got to ask questions about what's going on. Exactly. If you're watching the um, the, the video uh, version of this um, podcast, we're looking at some flooding in uh, the Czech Republic, um, taken by a um, a drone, uh, one of those drone copters, which is a, some really amazing footage. Um, thanks very much to uh, SkyShots.cz for for some of that footage. But um, but as you see, the the houses along the uh, riverbanks they're just inundated, and um, you know really really horrible stuff because it puts some um, people's lives on hold and, and ruins businesses and that sort of thing. So um, I hope uh, that the floodwaters have, um, have receded and people have been able to fix up uh, some of the damage that's been done there, Gareth. Yeah, now the, 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 the next point that I'd like to make, Glenn, is that 
most of those events have got one thing in common and your cold spring is a part of that. It's the fact that the northern hemisphere jet stream has found itself um, meandering. It make, it's making much bigger loops around sort of like a, like a, a how, how do we put it? It's, it, it? Instead of blowing straight round the earth, which is what the uh, a vigorous jet stream would do, it's, it's slowed down. And so it loops up to the north and then loops down to the south. And it tends to get stuck in those positions. And so when London is on the cold side in a cold loop, um, you get cold weather. You get a cold winter or you get a cold spring and you get rainfall and all the rest of it because the storm tracks are going well to the south or coming right over you, whatever it happens to be. Um, and then on the other side of that loop, there'll be warmth, unseasonal warmth. And that's what's been happening with Calgary, for example. The rainfall there is related to a big loop of, of the, the jet stream. And in the warm side of that um, is Alaska. And Alaska has been having um, a real heat wave over the last uh, week or so. Mm. Um, again, related to the way that the jet stream is behaving. And in Germany, they've gone from the floods to having um, a heat wave. And in fact, uh, in my piece in Hot Topic yesterday, I said that um, extreme weather events were where the rubber hits the road. And in fact, in Germany, they had exploding roads. It literally got wow. so hot that the um, really? expansion joints couldn't cope and they went bang and uh, actually killed a motorcyclist because it, um, he, he, he failed to see this thing. And as it happened, he basically was thrown into the air. Oh my goodness, that is, um, that's crazy, that is full on. So, and, so this is something that um, the uh, weather experts in the UK um, are looking at because this is the same pattern that occurred last year, didn't it? Um, in the run up to the Olympic Games, there was concern about that um, jet, jet stream, exactly where it was, and it was pushing all this um, cooler, moist air onto the UK. Um, it eventually corrected or, or went back into the normal pattern, I think in late July or or August, um, but the UK weather experts are, 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 have been meeting over the past week or so to try and figure out exactly what, what's going on. Yes, that's right. I mean, the, the, the weather in Britain over the last um, seven or eight years has been at least, I mean, in Britain, it's difficult. Everybody talks about the weather and everybody assumes that the, the British weather is pretty foul. But in fact, it seems to have been particularly foul <laughs> with a run of wet summers. And in the last three or four years, actually since about, since the major um, Arctic ice loss of 2007, the, um, there's been a, uh, a run of extreme cold spells in winter. Now, um, the Met Office uh, have been meeting in Exeter. Uh, they're going to try and figure out whether the unusual seasons were the result of natural variation or linked to the effects of climate change such as melting Arctic sea ice. Um, Stephen Belcher, who's the um, head of the Met Office there, uh, said we've seen a run of unusual seasons in the UK and northern Europe such as the cold winter of 2010, last year's wet weather and the cold spring this year. This may, may be nothing more than a run of natural variability but there may be other factors impacting the weather. I haven't heard the results of their talks. Um, what, 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 what ex do you expect would come out of talks like that, John? Do you think that they would uh, come up with a conclusion at all about the, the the weird weather in Europe, or or do you think they'll just sort of um, say, well, you know, um, it's inconclusive at this stage. No one really knows what's going on. What do you think, John? Uh, well, there's already been um, peer-reviewed research indicating that Arctic sea ice probably has had an impact on some of the weird northern hemispheric weather, some of those uh, record snowy winters, and and the reason why is because with the melting Arctic sea ice, that that's uh, just creating uh, different conditions in the Arctic, and and it's pushing the pushing the cold weather south over the over Europe, over North America, and it, I, I think a good metaphor for understanding it is it's like leaving the fridge door open, and and the um, mm. the cold air is leaking into the kitchen, and so there is evidence that this this is happening, um, but I, it's. I, often it's a case of is it one or the other. Usually there's a, there's a mix of the both, and there's probably internal variability and and uh, and Arctic sea ice uh, melt uh, con contributing to to both of them. 
Okay. Do you, do you, Gareth, do you think it's good um, to see the uh, the Met Office meeting in this way and in a very sort of public way to discuss um, natural variability versus climate change? Um, I, I think it do, I think it's very good that they're doing it because, um, to my mind, this is one of the areas where um, climate science uh, meets kind of weather forecasting in real time because none of the modeling that was done for AR4 for the fourth IPCC report and much of the modeling for the fifth IPCC report, um, that just doesn't pick up what's happening uh, with the Arctic. Most of the models show the Arctic um, reduction in the sea ice happening much later than we're actually experiencing it. Um, and I saw something from Jason Box today talking about Greenland and the effect that there was another recent piece of science that suggested last year's extremely hot Greenland summer was caused by an unusual loop in the jet stream. And Jason was making the point that the current crop of models simply don't pick up um, a rapidly melting Greenland caused by the changes that we can already see happening. So mm. this is a big problem for climate modeling. Um, climate models tend to work on a big scale quite well. So they, they pick up the global picture and when you average across them all you get what's called a multi-model mean and you can be reasonably confident that the, because the physics is right that they're getting the big picture right. The problem is that we don't live in a big picture and we don't live in a multi-model mean. We live in one planet and we live in a region of the world so you know we're, we're transcontinental here on the climate show but um, what the models are not terribly good at is working out what happens in a given place at a given time under a given set of circumstances. Mm -hmm. And so because they're not picking up what's happening in the Arctic as fast as it's happening, there is this big kind of knowledge gap. Um, we've got climate change happening, the Arctic is warming, the um, jet stream is behaving oddly, we're getting these extreme weather events because there's more energy in the system and we don't really have a very good handle on how that's going to play out. So whilst we can be reasonably confident about the amount of warming we might see by 2050, there is this sort of gap in the middle and the fact that Brit Britain's climate science community and its weather forecasting community are, are working together on this issue I think is a good is a very good thing and I would I would like to see. I, th I think this is um, it's almost serious enough, I think, for there to be some sort of climate science Manhattan project mm. to try and really get a handle on what's happening in the Northern Hemisphere now and in the near future. Okay, all right, moving on, because we've talked about um, these, those flood, flooding events in various parts of the world, but there are also some um, heat events, uh, fire, in fact, in Colorado. Colorado were um, battling the most destructive wildfires in the U.S. state's history. Uh, did these wildfires come a little bit earlier than, than um, expected, John, at all, or is this the, the wildfire season right now? Well, it's not just the uh, heat that's contributing to the wildfires. Uh, what's actually happening is um, it's, it's really the conditions uh, have made the forest vulnerable to wild, wildfires. I was actually um, in Colorado a few weeks ago and driving up the Rocky Mountains and as you, as you drove past the forest it was just striking how huge uh, chunks of the forest were dead uh, and this has just happened over the last few years and what's happening in, in the Rocky Mountains is, is the winters are getting warmer and normally the winters are cold enough to control the, the, the pine bark beetles or the, the different bark, bark beetles that they have in the Rocky Mountains but with the warmer winters now, the, the beetles aren't getting uh, killed off during the winter and consequently they're, they're killing the trees there. So big chunks of the forests there are, are now dead and, and this is our prime condition for wildfires. So while we were there in the Rocky Mountains, uh, a lightning strike started a wildfire there and, and before you knew it, uh, uh, there was a huge wildfire, a huge plume of smoke going up into the sky that we could see from where we were staying. And, and yeah, so it's the, it's the conditions that have made uh, these kind of regions vulnerable to wildfire. All right. Well, <clears throat> moving on from the, uh, from the wildfires here in Colorado uh, to this um, a huge amount of money 
that's being put um, uh, as the cost of last year's extreme weather, 110 billion US dollars. Uh, last year's extreme weather um, cost uh, was is that just the the US or the world, Gareth? No, that's just the US. That's the figure that NOAA put on um, the damages in in the US. So <laughs> that's an amazing cost to the economy. Now, obviously, extreme weather happens um, somewhere all the time, but the extent of the extremes that they're seeing in the US um, is is costing them a lot of money, and uh, I, I can't run through what they all are. I'd have to go and check back. But the, um, the 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 extremes, as we've been talking talking about them, are bringing real costs to all of the economies of the world now. Um, there is definitely a significant increase in the costs of these things, and the impacts are very real for the people suffering them so just in the last um, month or two they've had these um, huge tornadoes one of them probably the most intense measured in the US um, I believe at one stage the the tornado was something like two miles across which is just a sort of staggering um, sort of thing I mean maybe they've been one or two of that sort of scale before. I, I shouldn't really talk about this because I'm no expert. You should look at Jeff Master's site for this. But the scale of the cost to the economy of all of these things, um, and you know, societies have to organise to be able to cope with them. That's what resilience is all about. And in fact, a large part of adapting to the climate change that we can't avoid is going to be learning to adapt to the damage that's done by extreme weather events. And of course, one of those extreme weather events was um, was Hurricane Sandy, which devastated parts of the Mid Atlantic and Northwest. That was a, a very, very costly event. John, do you, do you think the U.S. can sustain that kind of cost every single year, or can the insurance industry worldwide sustain these um, extreme weather events? Can can they keep paying out? Well, I mean, the important thing to realise is this is only going to increase. It's only extreme weather is only going to get more intense and, and the question isn't whether uh, global warming causes specific events the question is does does global warming affect weather and we've got more heat in the system more moisture in the system so yes global warming is is affecting weather it's making it more intense and when you look at the amount of extreme weather events that are happening and you compare it to the amount of um, for example, geological events like earthquakes and tsunamis, the the weather is is pulling away at an accelerating accelerating rate. So so this is only getting worse, and and the expense to society is only going to uh, increase. Whether they can afford it or not, well, I mean, I guess that's that's another point is that the opponents of climate action they don't like. Um, aggressive government intervention in, in uh, regulating industry and just they don't like big government at all. But all this as the weather in, intense, intensifies, it requires more government intervention. So by, by pulling back on mitigation, by pulling back on climate action, they're actually creating a world that they don't like. Yeah, indeed. And a, a world that um uh, vineyards uh, and winemakers don't like either by the uh, look of this um, event that uh, happened in uh, Bordeaux in France. Gareth, tell us about this extreme weather event that affected um, a whole lot of winemakers. Well, it, 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 they had floods in Burgundy for a start. Now, Burgundy is the home of the Pinot Noir grape, and Burgundy still makes the... Um, probably the finest Pinot Noirs in the world, although I happen to think the one I make is quite nice. But <laughs> the flooding in Burgundy was then followed by um, an amazing hailstorm that just, you've got it on screen there, Glenn, just stripped the vines um, in Vouvray. And the damage that was done was such that these were left basically as vine stumps sticking out of the ground. That means that those farmers, the vines will recover, they'll put some leaf on and grow again, but they won't have any crop this year. Mm. And that happened in the space of about five minutes. Wow. Um, just a really intense um, uh, hailstorm. Now, of course, hail damage is not unknown. Um, so 
you know, they, 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 this this sort of thing happens from time to time. But the intensity of the storm and the scale of the damage was something that people in this area um, had had uh, no memory of. Uh, and, you know, it, it's just a difficult thing to comprehend that you could lose an entire crop in five minutes. Um, we get and, hail and it's, it's in funny North because... Canterbury, and yes, it can be quite damaging for the vines. Um, yeah. But, you know, would I, could I expect to lose my whole crop? I'm probably not. No, and it's it's funny because winemakers are um, one sector of the um, horticultural community who thought that they might benefit from climate change um, with the, you know more regions opening up as it warms up to uh, to wine making. Uh, but this just shows that um, you know there are, are other events that uh, yeah that, that are that are bad for. Um, for, for wine growers, um, extreme weather events like hail, like I suppose um, extreme frost in, in certain um, situations as well, that um, that can affect all of this, all this all this variability that comes with climate change. Yeah, well, a good example of that, Glenn, is that the warming of the last uh, thirty years has led to an enormous expansion of the uh, wine business, the wine growing in England. And so there, there are very large vineyards now to the south of London, um, nice places to visit. And English sparkling wine particularly has um, been winning, winning awards. And there are people who will tell you that the climate of Champagne, which, you know, is where the finest bubbly was uh, invented and um, may still be made. But the, the finest, you know, the Champagne climate is now moved to the southern England. So that's great people have put money in they've planted lots of vines they're making lots of wine and then along come the wet summers that England's had over the last five years and that makes it really hard when I mean, if you get a long wet summer or very wet autumn it makes it very very hard to to bring a good crop of quality grapes in and so last autumn in England people were throwing away their grapes because they just simply could not ripen them or if they could ripen them they were rotting because it was too wet um, so the real challenges and I was talking to somebody who has made a study of um, the wine business's response to climate change um, at the recent conference in New Zealand that I attended and I actually put a little bit of that um, audio up on Hot Topic um, uh, Professor Barry Smith from uh, the University of Guelph in Canada and he told me that people would, were um, beginning to think that the best burgundies were actually being made to the north of Burgundy. Mm. Um, now that's interesting because in France particularly it's the place that the wine comes from, the Appellation um, and the terroir of that spot, something that it kind of, has kind of evolved over hundreds if not thousands of years. All of the value of the wine is tied up into a plot of land, a particular place. Now if the climate is changing as rapidly as it seems to be and you've got all of your capital tied up in what was one of the world's finest Burgundy vineyards, what happens when you can no longer make fine Burgundy? Yeah. That's a really big problem. What you make fine Oxfordshire or something. <laughs> Well, that's right. But you see, for for a country like France, where where you know the the quality of the wine is tied to the place so tightly, I mean, for for a New Zealand or an Australian winemaker, it's less of a problem because we don't have that long history. Mm. You know, you so you could go down to Central Otago and plant Syrah down there instead of Pinot Noir. You know, you might be a might be a shame to have to do that to 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 swap from fine Pinot to to to, to fine Syrah. But you can do it, and mm. the, you know you can respond that way. And in, the, in Australia, as I'm sure John's aware, um, winemakers have for the last 20 years been moving into Tasmania to look for cooler climates. They've been moving up the slopes in Victoria to look for those cooler slopes where they can continue to make their fine wine. I think this is a good um, good time right now to insert the interview that um, Gareth did with uh, Bill. McKibben. Uh. Yes, um, it was. I I got a, um, a a short slot in Bill's very busy schedule while he was touring New Zealand. He, the previous evening, he'd just spoken to I think over a thousand people in Auckland, and he was about to fly down to Dunedin to give a talk there, and then back up to Wellington after my interview. He um, did a, a live stream with um, in from the House of Parliament and also then did a uh, talk in Wellington. So he, he'd spent a, a few days prior to that in Australia. So I, 
caught up with with Bill and I asked him about 350.org and I asked him about his message um, on the Do the Math tour about um, working out what it is we've got to do in order to address uh, imminent climate change. Very good to be back, Eric. So you're up in Auckland? En route to Dunedin today. Excellent. And I gather you had a, a good turnout for your talk last night. Yes, every... Every seat was filled. It was good fun and the same across Australia. So the message is getting across this part of the world. Wonderful, wonderful. So you're doing the Do the Math tour or Do the Maths, I think, as you've uh, altered it slightly for, <laughs> for us Antipodeans. Um, tell me, what is, the, what is that math? Well, the math's pretty easy, really, Gareth. I, I mean, I... People have been, there have been little reports and things about it over the years, but I kind of laid it out for the first time in a big piece in Rolling Stone last summer that mm. went uh, kind of oddly viral, turned into one of the most shared pieces ever. And here's the deal. As you know, everybody knows, the one thing the world's governments have agreed on about how much, what we should do about climate is that we should keep the temperature from increasing more than two degrees. Yeah. Not a very wise target. One degree is melted the Arctic, whatever. Scientists say keep it, you know, we're already too high. But the only line we've got to sort of hold the world governments to is two degrees. Scientists, so that's what the governments have said, two degrees. Scientists have said, here's how much carbon you could burn and have some hope of staying below two degrees, roughly 500 and some gigatons, um, 500 and some billion tons. Yeah. Okay. Um, this doesn't give you a perfect guarantee of staying below two degrees, but it's about the right ballpark. Okay. The third number doesn't come from governments or from scientists. Uh, it comes from financial guys. And they figured it out, a team called Carbon Tracker, um, by adding up all the reserves of coal and oil and gas that the fossil fuel industry has filed, you know, in stock exchange filings, annual reports, all those kind of official things. And it turns out that the fossil fuel companies and the countries that operate like fossil fuel companies, think Venezuela, already have in their reserves on the books uh, about 2,800 gigatons of carbon, or five times more than the most conservative governments say we could safely burn. And so you quickly see the, um, the problem here. If you're going to make, if you're going to make the two to three target, you have to leave about 80% of their reserves in the ground. But if you do that, uh, it will, you know, it will come at great cost to the richest industry on earth who do everything they can to make sure it doesn't happen. And there are certainly plenty of signs that the industry has been doing that. They've been um, uh, camp well, pa paying for campaigns to, um, you know, act for action against uh, emissions reductions, haven't they? All oh, absolutely. The world. No, I mean, in the U.S., you know, this is who funds the Tea Party. Uh, in Australia, it's who funds the Abbott, you know, who, that's where the Abbott government will come from if it gets formed, on yep. and on and on. Yep. Um, um, so we need to figure out how to weaken them politically and financially. And this is a way. As people look at these numbers, they start to understand that these are no longer to be considered normal industries that they're in some sense a kind of rogue industry, yeah. uh, outlawed against the laws of physics, as it were. And um, that begins to change their political power some. We need to make them into the tobacco companies. The financial guys look at it and understand that what's described here is a classic bubble, yeah. um, i.e., it's not in this case that they've built more houses than people want to live in. It's that they've got more carbon than the world has said it's going to use. HSBC and Sydney put out a, a report showing that if the world took that two degree target seriously, you'd have to cut the share values of the fossil fuel companies in half. Wow. Okay. So um, if you invest in those companies, it's a bet that the world never will do anything about climate change. Now, that's both an uh, unwise bet for financial reasons, 
and an immoral bet uh, for practical ones. If it's wrong to, to wreck the climate, it's wrong to profit from that wreckage. And so with both those ideas in mind, one of the things we've done with this math is launch this divestment campaign. Yeah. First in the U.S., now in the Antipodes, uh, soon all over the world. Um, and it's beginning to kick in uh, on 380 college campuses in the U.S. Kids are fighting to get their boards of trustees to divest. Ten big cities have already done so. Seattle, San Francisco. It's moving into uh, religious communities. When I was in Australia last week, the Uniting Church of Australia, uh, the biggest Protestant denomination there, announced that it was divesting its coal stocks, which is a big deal in, sure. a, uh, in a coal mining company, country. Um, so this is beginning early days, but beginning to take hold in a good way. And here in New Zealand, uh, uh, at uh, fossilfree.org slash nz, people are, are going to work on this problem too. Um, um, trying, trying for super annuation funds, pension funds to divest, working in colleges and universities to get them to divest their holdings, so on and so forth. It's a good fight. Um, um, it's not the only fight. Uh, once you know those numbers, you know how crazy it is for us to be going to look for more coal and gas and oil when we already have more than we can burn. So it helps make people understand how crazy it is for New Zealand to be considering new offshore exploration for oil. We need no more oil. We've got more than we can burn. Um, that's the hole that we're in. And when you're in a hole, the first rule is stop digging. <laughs> Literally, in this case. Yes, absolutely. Well, unfortunately, the, as far as New Zealand is concerned, we're still intent on building new open cast coal mines and, as you said, drilling around the country. But there's been, I think, um, our own solid energy fossil fuel extraction business has done a fair bit by uh, <clears throat> by costing the government a lot of money. So that's been, yes. that's been a step in the right direction. Yes, and these guys are in more financial trouble than they sometimes admit. You can sort of see it in the desperation to get this stuff out of the ground quickly. Yeah. They understand that in a few more years, I mean, with each passing day, with each lesson that Mother Nature teaches us about the eroding climate, it becomes harder to imagine a future where we keep doing this. If they can't get this stuff out of the ground in the next few years, it'll stay there forever. That's why they're desperate to do it now. Yeah. Now, financial markets um, are often said to run on sentiment. So I would guess that your your strategy is to, to, to change the perception of the market. Yeah, and in this case, we're not actually trying to bankrupt Exxon. I don't think we can do that in the short run. But I do think we can change the perception of them and that that's very important at this point. Yeah, the tobacco companies are still operating, aren't they? So They are. And the tobacco companies offer a cautionary tale, you know. Uh, the reason they're still operating and profitable is because they've all moved their operations to China and they're busy, uh, you know, killing people there. Yeah. Um, if then the fossil fuel industry is obviously trying to do the same thing in a lot of ways. Um, so that's why we have a global movement. That's why 350.org works everywhere, China included. Yeah. So how is, how is 350.org getting on in China? Um, China is an interesting place to work, Eric. Um, on the one hand, they're, you know, they've emulated some of the worst in Western technology and ideas. They borrowed our coal-fired power plants and our coal, you know, and, and now they're making like we did a hundred years ago, you know. Yeah. Um, but they're also pioneering renewable energy at a rapid pace. You know, 250 million Chinese get their hot water from solar panels on their roofs. Yeah, you know? yeah. That's pretty amazing. Um, huge wind installations. Uh, they've been driving down the price, as you know, photovoltaic cells at an incredibly rapid rate to the point where they're almost a commodity item now. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we're, uh, uh, China's both hurting and helping. And, um, and it's a fascinating place because the Chinese understand that they're under the gun. The Himalayas are melting. Uh, they have enormous drought problems already in the north. 
yeah. the Florida Delta, where their manufacturing base is, is only a few meters above sea level. So it's tough. Absolutely. So we hit. Um, at Mount Aloha, 400 parts per million um, very recently. Yes. Um, so, I mean, we want to be at 350, preferably below that, I guess. So yes. we need to go beyond just the sticking to that 500 gigaton uh, budget that you're talking about to go, right. to go and That's take right. it out of the air. For now, for now, all we're doing frankly, is just trying to turn the trajectory around. The yeah. International Energy Agency announced yesterday, that yet again, we've emitted more carbon than the year before. We're still going up. Yeah. And we've got to, you know, before we can get back down to 350, we've got to stop short of 450, yeah. you know? Yeah. But yes, you're right. Um, uh, we're not solving the problem. We're trying to prevent complete calamity at this point. Well, Bill, uh, I'm more power to your elbow, I, I have to say, because it is one of the most depressing things when you um, you look at the evidence of what's happening now, you know, the floods in Germany and the state of the Arctic sea ice. It's It, it, it boggles my mind, to, to coin a phrase, that the, the, politi the world's leaders aren't sort of sitting up and saying, hey, we've got to do something about this. The world's leaders will sit up and do something when we have a movement large enough to make them do it. And that's what we're trying to build. And we're grateful to everybody who's helping out, you included. Okay, Bill. Well, look, thank you very much for your time no this worries. morning. I know you're on a tight schedule. Have a great time in Dunedin. Have some haggis and scotch because it's a very it's a very Scottish place, Dunedin. I, I like Dunedin a lot. I can't wait to get down there. You take care. Thank you, Bill. Bye-bye. And that was Gareth's interview with Bill McKibben. Uh, nice one, Gareth. Thanks very much for um, for providing that for the for the climate show as well. I know that that was uh, also up at hot-topic.co.nz, and just by chance, not by chance, really, by absolute design, that is where you'll find all the show notes for the climate show as well. Um, all up there, everything we've been talking about. You'll find all the links, all the nice photos, and that sort of thing as well. Plus links to the audio version and if you're watching the video then you're already watching it but if you're listening to the audio version there is a video version as well and you can find that also at, up at hot-topic.co.nz. Um, let's move on with more news. Um, the new Aussie climate report says that 80% of the world's fossil fuel reserves must stay in the ground. Uh, uh, we'll go to John for this one. Um, They've got to stay in the ground, otherwise, what? We're going to burn up. Well, basically, they, they set a budget. They say that um, we need to avoid burning more than a thousand gigatons or a thousand billion tons of carbon by 2050. And, and we've already burned up a big chunk of that. And so, it, I guess it's, it just, it's a really good way of looking at it. Um, like, like our climate has inertia, our climate has a has a has momentum and so it, when we start um, when you have global warming it takes a while for the oceans to burn, to warm um, but but it, it builds momentum and it's hard to stop it and society is the same way society has momentum and the decisions that we make now what we invest in what what we what infrastructure we we build um, goes on into the future so the decisions we make now will will determine how much carbon we're going to burn over the next few decades. And so what they're saying is now is really the critical decade where what decisions we make now over this next decade will determine how much carbon we're going to burn over, over the next century. And if we burn more than a thousand billion tonnes of carbon, then we're, we're, we've got a more than likely chance that we're going to uh, experience more than two degrees of warming. Mm. which is uh, generally considered a, a safe limit. Even that's questionable. I would say that two degrees of warming is, is not very safe at all. But, but if we go over that, then, then things are even more dangerous. This, um, this same report also says that uh, this whole debate, so-called debate about whether or not climate change is happening or not, has cost Australia, but I guess the whole world really by proxy, um, it's cost us precious time to try and mitigate the effects as well. Right, John? That's right, and, and as we'll discuss a little bit later in the show, the scientists have stopped debating the basic facts of global warming, whether it's happening, whether humans are causing it. They, they stopped debating this decades ago, and yet 
the society, the general public, and, and policymakers are still arguing over this ba these basic facts. So really, the policymakers and the public need to get with the program that, that scientists had already decided uh, decades ago, and and concentrate their full attention on the solutions, on acknowledging that we are causing this problem and what do we do to fix it. It's a particularly tough message to sell in Australia where um, the fossil fuel digging boom has, has played such a huge part in the economy in recent years. Yeah, that's right. and. and it's, I'm a little bit embarrassed to being a Queenslander. I'm proud of our football team, but I'm not proud of the fact that our coal industry is is determined to dig as much coal out of Queensland as possible and export it to the world. And I heard a quote from the Queensland Premier, Campbell Newman, uh, over the weekend where he, he um, proudly boasted that, that Queensland's in the coal business and that that's more important than the Great Barrier Reef. And that just broke my heart hearing hearing uh, Queensland's leader so brazenly uh, throw the throw our environment and one of Australia's greatest icons under the bus uh, just because of the the greed and and making a buck from all the coal that's in the ground here. Let's move on because a little bit earlier on in the show we were talking about this jet stream and uh, the discussions that the Met Service uh, here in the UK were um, having about uh, whether or not the jet stream is. Um, uh, affecting the, the the climate of the UK longer term, whether or not it's linked to climate change. But there is um, new research from the University of Sheffield that has shown that uh, unusual changes in the jet stream circulation caused the exceptional surface mount of the Greenland ice sheet in the summer of 2012. I guess this research, Gareth, is confirming what we already knew about this uh, the effect the jet stream was having on Greenland. Uh, yeah, I think it was. Um, as, as I said a little bit earlier, that it, it all seems to be hanging together. That the, the changes that we're seeing in the jet stream are beginning to have um, very, very significant effects. Uh, the actual piece of research doesn't, um, at the moment, uh, tie directly into the. It doesn't say that it's the loss of the Arctic sea ice that caused that weather pattern over Greenland. They, they, they're. they're if you like, causal factor is more to do with sea temperatures off the uh, eastern coast of Greenland there, there was the northwestern North Atlantic. Um, but these things, they're kind of complex because there's so much going on, so many factors in play. And there's no doubt that the, um, from the work of another team led by Jennifer Francis, uh, that the reduction in the temperature gradient between the North Pole and the equator is making the um, there's less energy going into the jet stream because weather is driven by the, the difference in temperatures between hot and cold things. Um, and because of that reduction in, in temperature gradient, you're getting the slower jet stream, you're getting the big meanders. But it does seem to be um, getting locked over Greenland more often than not. Um, and this research in, you know, basically lays out the mechanism of how that happens. What about you, John? Do you think um, you know, that, that, that this jet stream, you know, it, well, are there any other effects that the, that you think we might see from changes in the jet stream, um, you know, the, the changes of this air circulation? Do you think there will be some surprises in there as well? Yeah, that's a good question and the question of surprises because like one of the big, um, one of the big things that our climate deniers bring up is uncertainty. And ironically, the uncertainty in climate models always ends up with them being certain that humans aren't causing global warming. But, but I, I think talking about uh, the the effects, like the unexpected effects in one way of, of the jet stream on Greenland and and some of the earlier effects that we were talking about, it really underscores the fact that uncertainty is our friend. That what we're discovering uh, from year to year is is a range of nasty surprises that that in many cases weren't anticipated. And so it, it shows that, yes, climate is complex. And yes, there's, there's a lot of things happening that we're just starting to get a, get a handle on. But that means that there's a lot of, a lot of um, especially localised effects that, that, that are really impacting society and 
changes in the jet stream mean that, that things are happening in certain regions that hadn't happened before and and we we build our infrastructure in our society based on on what climate was how it's behaved in the past we're talking about uncertainty one certain thing uh, before the G8 summit that happened last week was that climate was not going to be on the agenda because no one was talking about it and if the, the show is all about all about of course the science and the weather uh, and everything else around climate change is of course it's also about the politics and it was um, a, a real shame to see that climate change dropped off the agenda from these very important heads of state from all around the world came together to discuss things like war you know the crisis in Syria um, uh, but unfortunately nothing to do with the biggest issue affecting mankind in the world today and into the future um, it, it really doesn't you know you can have all these localized conflicts uh, and, um, and and crises around the world but the the underlying problem will not go away and that is climate change and it will uh, stay with us and unfortunately it dropped off the the agenda despite the um, the Queen's speech in May which sets out uh, the government's policy here in the UK for the year ahead listed climate change as one of the five priorities for the um, G8 UK's G8 presidency but um, <laughs> It completely dropped off. Um, was that a surprise at all, Gareth? No, not really. <laughs> they they seem to think that they can get away without doing very much at all, and and they throw themselves into um, the kind of negotiating process for the next phase of um, the uh, UNFCC, uh, you know, carbon reduction policies, whatever they turn out to be. But there was a there was a meeting in Bonn. Um, over a couple of weeks ago and that all got hijacked and sort of lost in the pro no process was made because Russia did Russia didn't want to agree to something and then somebody else didn't want to agree to something else so the whole thing got kind of hijacked mm. but I have to say that um, my, the, there is at least what has the potential to be good news and that is that um, a Barack Obama, the President of the United States of America, has decided to uh, make an announcement on climate change policy and that I think is going to happen Tuesday of this week. Okay. Um, he has um, issued a YouTube video in which he talks about um, why this is an important thing that he's going to be doing. And there's certainly a lot of rumor going around in the US media at the moment of exactly what he's going to say. Um, but by the time the show reaches the, uh, reaches the air, I guess, that particular bit of news which has the potential to be good and I think you know we really should be encouraging um, Obama and the, the US to get on and, and and join the rest of the world in taking the issue seriously and you know, taking some leadership on it so I have my fingers crossed both fingers firmly well, crossed for the, something significant from the as US. You, as you say that the speech will probably be out by the time the show is out but uh, can you do any crystal ball gazing Gareth <laughs> what, what do you think he's going to come up with? <laughs> I think we'll probably see that there that there will be a target for um, 2020, uh, which might be slightly stronger. Uh, I believe the word on the streets is that um, it will be done by um, basically swapping coal for natural gas, for fracking um, gas. Mm. Uh, but the detail of it, Glenn, I I don't know. There's a lot of guesswork going on at the moment. What about you, John? Any you want to put up any predictions? For Obama's speech, uh, yeah, no, it's it's difficult to say. Like, the, what I'm really interested in is what his decision about the pipeline will be, in. and I, I don't know whether he'll be mentioning that at this stage. But but I think Bill McKibben um, had a good response to the news that, that Obama was making a speech. He said that uh, if if he did um, pledge uh, strong climate action in this speech, but then went on to to approve the pipeline, the Keystone pipeline, then it would really be taking, making two steps forward and two steps back. So, so fingers crossed that uh, we'll get uh, strong decisions from Obama on both fronts. Yeah. Okay. He's yeah. been a disappointment in every other area. So, um, <laughs> don't don't, don't ha have your expectations too high. Um, right. Let's move on. Let's move on to the final part of the show. And uh, this is really, um, really John's segment uh, this time round. Um, it's all about the consensus project. John, tell us about this. What is it? Well, this is something that Skeptical Science has been working on for about a year and a half now. And 
what we decided to do was uh, continue the work of Naomi Rezquez and extend it. What Naomi did in 2004 was she did an analysis of, of climate papers from 1993 to 2003, just reading the abstracts and, and just trying to measure the, the level of consensus on whether humans were causing global warming. And what she found out of about 900 odd papers was that zero papers rejected the consensus. Wow. So, so climate denial was had a negligible presence in the um, peer reviewed literature. And so we decided to extend this to add another decade, 1991 to 2011. And, and that, that got up to about 3000 papers. And because we were a glutton for punishment, we'd also decided to include global warming papers Naomi only looked at global climate change papers. So that got us up to 12,000 papers. Since, since we finished the um, analysis, I, I found out that two other projects or two other groups tried to do something similar, but they only did about 1,000 papers in each analysis and neither of them completed. So if I'd known that at the time, I probably wouldn't have um, got so ambitious with 12,000 papers. Yeah. But we, um, we managed to get through it over a few months of writing abstracts. And what we found was out of 12,000 papers, about 4,000 papers stated the position on human caused global warming in their abstract. And among those 4,000 papers, over 97% endorsed the consensus that humans were causing global warming. Mm. Uh, the other interesting thing was that this was a 20 year period, 1991 to 2011. The consensus had already formed in the early 1990s. So climate scientists had already settled settled the question of human cause global warming over 20 years ago. And the other thing which was interesting was we found that the consensus actually got stronger over that period. It was already strong at the start, it even got stronger as time went on. Yeah. And and then we thought, well, you know, there's a few people on the internet that aren't a big fan of skeptical science. So maybe we should do an independent check of our result. And so we emailed all the authors of the papers uh, in our, in our, in the 21 years of climate research and invited them to, to rate the level of endorsement of their own papers. We figured who would be the best expert to, to rate a paper than, than the authors of the paper themselves. Mm. We got about, no, we got exactly 1,200 scientists um, responding and rating their own papers. So out of that, about 2,000 papers got a rating. And the result was um, when we rated the abstracts, we got a 97.1% consensus. When the scientists rated their own papers, the result was a 97.2% consensus. So a very strong confirmation of our result and an independent confirmation. Gosh, it's, a, it's extremely, extremely strong. Were you surprised by the result at all? Uh, well, we, we did expect that there would be a, um, a strong consensus. Uh, we, we didn't go out, like, we, we weren't exactly sure what the final form would take, like uh, how, how we were going to analyze the results. So, so when we got that 97% figure, which is, which is quite a well-known figure to, to people who are familiar with climate science because there's, there's been several studies of the climate science community in the past or several surveys and in each case they found that 97% of actively publishing climate scientists uh, agreed with the consensus. So, so yeah, it was, it was just confirmation of, of previous studies and then confirmation of our own result. Mm. Um, and of course, this this issue of consensus is a really important one because it, it was um, highlighted to me just a few weeks back, um, chatting to a friend who uh, we, the topic of climate change came up, and um, he was in the camp of, oh well, there's not consensus, is there? That you know, I've, I've heard that there are other scientists out there who who don't agree with us, who are who are skeptics. Um, and then from there, an hour or two hour uh, debate <laughs> ensued. But th 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 this is a very key issue that the skeptics use to seed doubt and therefore inaction in the minds of the public, right? So it is, it is the, the fact that they come out and say, no, not everyone agrees with this, with that climate change is happening. There is no consensus. So therefore, um, do nothing until we've worked it out. Yeah, from, from the outset, from the late 
1980s, the opponents of climate action have deliberately and very focused uh, attacked the scientific consensus and cast doubt on the level of agreement among climate scientists. And they've done it in a number of ways. Um, in 1991, Western Fuels Association ran a half million dollar campaign to, to reposition global warming as theory rather than fact. And the way they did it was to, they just had a couple of experts that they would get out, get out in front of the media just to portray that impression that there were a number of scientists dissenting. The, in, the, in the 2000 election, the US federal election, um, there was a um, Republican strategist, Frank Luntz, who issued a memo to Republicans advising them to, if, to cast out on the consensus, uh, attack the level of agreement. Mm -hmm. Because when people think that the scientists don't agree, then they're less likely to support climate policy. And just in, in recent years, from 2007 to 2010, the most popular climate myth among conservative columnists was there is no consensus. Yeah. In fact, just over the last few weeks, the Heartland Institute, um, they, they ran another campaign to try to cast out on the consensus by trying to portray the impression that the Chinese Academy of Science endorsed one of their denialist books. And it, it was essentially another attempt to, to um, portray this impression of ongoing debate among the scientific community. And it backfired massively because the Chinese Academy of Science didn't endorse it in any way whatsoever. And they came out with very strong language and kind of ominous threats of legal action against the Heartland Institute who immediately apologized and scrubbed any mention of, of the endorsement of the, from the Academy of Science of, of their book. So uh, it, was, it was a, it was rather amusing how it, how it um, panned out. But then a few days after that, the uh, Global Warming Policy Foundation, I think that the GWPF, which is a, a UK denialist uh, organization, they were um, under investigation for, I think it was for publishing misleading information in the media. And they came out with a statement saying the GWPF doesn't have any um, scientific position on global warming except that the science isn't settled. Yeah. So even when, when our denialist movements don't have a position on the science, they still think that there's no scientific consensus. Yeah. So, so this underscores the fact that, that attacking the scientific consensus is a central strategy of opponents of climate action. And the reason is clear, because when people think that the scientists disagree, then they don't support climate policy. And well, it, this is... This is a big concern because there is a big gap between public perception of consensus and the actual 97% reality. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been conducting uh, research over the last year and uh, about the psychology of climate change and the psychology of consensus. And I've been asking uh, US groups and Australian groups uh, how many climate scientists do they think agree on human-caused global warming? And the average answer is around 50%, wow. which is, a, which is a, a, a big difference from the actual 97% reality. And th this is the gap that you talk about, right? This large gap between the public perception of consensus and the actual reality of the 97% agreement. Um, I guess uh, you know, the, this, this, this project um, will hopefully help um, sort this out but and go a long way but I guess it needs the media to really pick up on this and, and drive it as well. There's a fantastic resource, um, the consensusproject.com. Has this been getting a bit of pick up, John? Yeah, well when the paper came out it got a huge amount of media attention. It, it blew us away really how much how much coverage it got, how broad the coverage was and, and just some of the unexpected outlets that covered it. So it was it was covered uh, in in all over the all over the planet, like a lot of non English speaking countries. Um so it's not just Australia has it been, and America. Has it been translated as well? Well the the articles in um, our, our website hasn't been translated or our paper, but articles covering the research in other languages in other languages have been published. 
thanks, thankfully Google Translate made it possible for me to check whether the articles were um, positive or negative. <laughs> and 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 a day after the paper came out, um, the President Obama's uh, Twitter account tweeted about the research wow. to 31 million followers. So that was a um, yeah, that was a real adrenaline shot for the research. Yeah. And the interesting consequence of that was then there was that there was uh, media coverage about the media coverage. <laughs> okay, so controversy then, John? Well, yeah, there was, um, as we expected, there was uh, lots of uh, criticisms of the paper from from the usual um, climate denier blogs. And we actually anticipated a lot of the criticisms. We, we sat down, spent a lot of time thinking about about how it might be attacked. We looked at all the attacks on Naomi Arezke's paper, on um, Peter Doran's consensus survey, and on William Anderegg's consensus survey, and we basically put together a frequently asked questions page, uh, anticipating most of the attacks on our paper. And, and true to form, most of them were. The interesting thing was the a, a lot of the attacks on our paper um, actually. Uh, match the the five characteristics of consensus denial. Yeah. Um, there's, like there's a paper published by Pascal Diethelm and I think it's Robert McKee, and where they look at um, all the different movements that deny a scientific consensus, whether it's climate change or smoking causing cancer or the link between HIV and AIDS, and they identify five characteristics that all these movements have in common raised expectations, conspiracy theories, fake experts, um, logical fallacies, I forget the fifth one. Um, but but anyway, um, these same patterns were apparent in the attacks on our paper as well. So that was a that was an interesting um, an interesting development. And yeah. and Dana Nucitali, who was one of the co authors of the paper, he um, he wrote about that in, in his Guardian blog. Well, I suppose there's only so many tactics the skeptics can deploy, right? And uh, and and they'll just keep on using the same ones, um, and it go, just keeps on going around in circles. I, I imagine, Gareth. You, I mean, you you'd come up against uh, many of these arguments, uh, and particularly that there is no consensus, just running um, a hot topic and 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 keeping those arguments at, at bay, no doubt. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I love the, um, the the ease with which they slip from there is no consensus, and then immediately. And Moncton is particularly good at this. Sorry, Moncton. Um, he, he says, but science isn't done by consensus. <laughs> so there isn't a consensus, and 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 science isn't done by consensus. So you know, they 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 can't have it both ways. But apparently they can because what they're doing is they're running a propaganda campaign. Um, the rest of the world is trying to study the subject, trying to work out, you know, how we solve this really, really, really difficult problem. And one of the ways that it's difficult is that it runs against the, the sorts of social psychology that, that John's been looking at and, and, and studying. You know, it kind of goes against the grain of the way that we work to, 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 to solve this problem. You know, it's a rational problem, but the propagandists don't have to deal with rationale you know they, they can devise campaigns they're advertising you know they're marketing um, they're creating doubt these are things that you know goes back to Naomi Oreskes and the merchants of doubt and, and so on it goes back a long way but they're running a campaign and basically they're we're we're almost forced to buy into the narratives that that, that, that they lay out and if I, if I had one wish for Christmas this year, it would be that as a whole, the, the scientific community, the political community would stop buying into the narratives that they kind of scatter out before us. Um, it's a big ask, I know, but it yeah, would be that's... really cool if we could stop worrying about global warming hiatuses and stop writing papers about global warming hiatuses and actually just get on with sorting out the problem. It's a fairly that's a really good point. wish. Yeah, that, that's a good point, though, Gareth. And um, Stephen Lewandowski gave a talk in Colorado on, on the topic of seepage or leakage, but uh, we decided seepage is a more appropriate term. And what he's talking about is the fact that the climate science community has been um, bombarded with so much attack, so much virulent um, criticism that 
they're, they're actually erring on the side of least drama is the phrase that yeah. Naomi Rezquez uses. They're, they're act whenever they uh, make estimates or statements, they tend to be as conservative as possible. So they're, they're actually um, erring towards too conservative an estimate. And the IPCC does this. That's what, as you mentioned earlier, their, their, their predictions for the Arctic sea ice melt is decades behind schedule. Or is, yeah, their, the reality is decades ahead of the uh, IPCC mm. predictions. And the, it's the same with um, the Antarctic ice sheet um, shrinkage and, and the Greenland ice sheets and the, their predictions on, um, on CO2 emissions. And so, so, and and Stephen Lewandowski used uh, his his uh, knowledge of cognitive science, of psychology, and and the existing literature to show, and the the ways that when people are attacked, when a community is attacked, they they react in this um, erring on the side of least drama way without even realizing it, and yeah. and there's there's growing evidence that that's what's happening with the climate science community, and. They, they really, it's something that needs to be looked at. We need to um, really uh, think about how, how we're framing the science and, and um, yeah, just, just address this issue of, of seepage. Now, you've actually addressed um, this issue in your own particular way. You've dropped a bomb on the debate in the last few days, John. <laughs> well, you know, it wasn't anything new. Um, I gave a talk at a uh, the climate action summit in Sydney on on Saturday just past, and they just asked me to talk about the science. And really, I just talked about the same things that I've been talking about for for years. And well, they did ask me to talk about the latest science, so I did um, update some of my graphs. But uh, it really, the the um, the response to the talk made me realize that Frank Luntz, who I uh, mentioned earlier, he, he actually said something about messaging once, which, um, which I've actually taken to heart. And he said that if you want to get a message across, you need to repeat it over and over and over and over and over again until you're sick to death of saying it. And only then people hear it for the first time. Now, I've been talking about the planet's heat imbalance for, for ages and, and, and what I found is a, a very um, uh, sticky way of expressing global warming is talking about how much heat our planet is building up uh, in units of Hiroshima bombs because the, the amount of heat our planet is building up is, is I guess um, it's the, the actual units are 10 to the power of 21 joules. That, that's generally how much energy our planet is building up, which is like one with 21 zeros behind it. Mm. Now, what does that mean? Like no one can conceptualize or understand what that means. But, it, but we're actually building up heat at a rate of four Hiroshima bombs worth of heat per second. So that, that's how much heat is, is building up every second, every day over the last few decades. Wow. Now, now the reason I use this metaphor is, and I actually gave a workshop during the during the climate action summit, was, and in the workshop I talked about sticky ideas. How do we make ideas that get people's attention, but also stick in the memory? And there's a book made to stick by the Heath brothers, where they talk about um, viral ideas and. Um, uh, urban legends and just just um, folk sayings, things that that are that are sticky, and and sticky ideas tend to have certain um, characteristics in common. They're simple, they're concrete, they're unexpected. They take people by surprise, and um, yeah, there's, they they often tell a story. And most of the ways that we communicate climate science are the opposite of this. They're complicated. They're abstract. They're they're obtuse and difficult to understand mm. but explaining the global warming and the, the planet's heat imbalance uh, through Hiroshima bombs worth of heat it, it ticks all the sticky boxes it's simple it's concrete mm. just based on your reaction now Glenn it, it takes people by surprise because they, they don't realize just how much heat our planet is building up and 
So, so I use this as an example of, of a sticky idea, and I think that that um that argument uh, was confirmed by the fact that a, a journalist who was at that event took that one sticky um message from one part of one talk throughout that whole day and used that as the headline. I thought the journalists who covered the the talk they, they actually um the one thing they kind of got wrong was they conflated my talk with Leslie Hughes' talk. Leslie Hughes from the Climate Commission. Uh, we we gave consecutive talks and they kind of mashed ours together. Unfortunately, Leslie didn't get a mention, which that that was really the main inaccuracy in the story. But in terms of summing up the science, they really did take a number of the key messages from both of our talks and and explain them quite well. And they even used one of my favourite jokes about um, how animals are. Uh, due to global warming, the animals are shifting to different regions, but they're also mating earlier in the year. And I explained that that's not because animals are getting randier; it's because um, the seasons themselves are shifting. So, <laughs> yeah. so that's my pet joke, and I even included that in. Right. <laughs> animals are not getting randier. Um, <laughs> that may, may be a, a title. Very sorry, Australian. Very Australian. How, how many? Sorry, how many Hiroshima bombs? Four per second. Four per second. It's, it is, it's an amazing statistic just to take away. It is. Absolutely yeah. staggering. I think, um, John, I, you used to uh, express the amounts of floods in the number of Sydney harbours um, of, of water, didn't you? <laughs> you're, uh, you're obviously think... uh, a man for the, um, for the sticky unit. <laughs> Sticky unit, yeah, that's a that's an interesting <laughs> phrase. Yeah, totally. I, I think we were talking before about how the atmosphere is getting uh, wetter, and and the way I talk about it is 900 Sydney harbours worth of water. Uh, there's yeah, there's 900 Sydney harbours worth of water more in the atmosphere now than there was 50 years ago. So that's how much uh, atmospheric moisture has gone up, and that's yeah. why we're seeing these flooding events. But yeah, you really do need to break it down to um, to concrete metaphors, and also try to try to choose appropriate metaphors where the the numbers aren't too big. Like a, uh, if it's too big, then it's hard, too hard to conceptualise. But anyone can tap four uh, times per second with their finger. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we well, think we might have a title for the show, perhaps. Yeah, Gareth, four, <laughs> four Hiroshima bombs a second. It's just, yeah, amazing. And and there are some great graphics um, and uh, and charts, and, and the information is set out in a really easy to understand way up at the consensusproject.com. I really recommend that. A lot of work has gone into that website, obviously. So I really recommend checking that out. And uh, I, 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 guess I should point out, Glenn, that, um, that it was actually SJI Associates, uh, a... Um, it's a PR agency from New York who put that website together. They they came to me and just said they were concerned about climate change. Could they do anything to help? And we said, well, actually, we have this uh, consensus paper coming out soon. You can you can you help us put together a website? And and I sent them the information. I sent them some some data, and they just threw these graphics together. And some of their explanations were, and and packages of the science were were some of the best. That I've seen the way they explain the greenhouse effect was just so succinct and visual and clear. It was beautiful. Yeah, there we go. There's the slide of the greenhouse effect. Reminds me of a slide I remember seeing as a as a kid when I first learned about the the, the greenhouse <laughs> effect in the 80s. It actually w was like that. You got the the sun's rays coming down and bouncing, some bouncing off, some staying inside the atmosphere, and then you've got the causes of um, greenhouse gases there in the middle. Yeah, brilliant. We need to see more of that, I think. Well, I think um, that has also um, brought us to the, the end of the show. We've run very long, but that's because we're, we're catching up for the first time in, in a few months, and there's been so much news uh, to, to get through as well and some of the, the important stuff that's happened over the past few months and, and very recently as well with some of those extreme weather events. The one thing that next time we talk about, um, I, we ought to see if we can get a hold of um, Jason Box and... Greenland, because he's been working on the Dark Snow Project, uh, looking at the impact of um, fires burning in uh, in the Northern Hemisphere, darkening the snow on Greenland and hastening the melt. And that was a crowdfunded, um, the first crowdfunded scientific expedition uh, that Peter Sinclair from Climate Crocs is uh, in Greenland at the moment. So 
it would be nice to see if we can find out a bit more news about what's happening up there and we'll be a bit further on in the sea ice melting season um, so there's always an awful lot to look at up north let's hope that's all we have to look at and we don't have to look at more pictures of disasters happening around the world well that's right and uh, it was a near thing um, just in the past week uh, in your neck of the woods there Gareth with the with the snow and flooding uh, around New Zealand yeah well I spent yesterday digging a trench across my trufia to <laughs> get rid of the water because truffles don't like sitting in water but my favorite picture of the of the weekend was my local ski field is Mount Hutt and they had 2.8 meters of snow um, nice. in the uh, storm that hit New Zealand uh, which is nine feet in the old money <laughs> wow. and um, it's if you look at the the, the graph of um, snow depths it kind of goes from zero to um, three meters it's it's almost at the maximum they've had in the last uh, 12 years already so <laughs> quite quite staggering stuff and uh, and John uh, what about you for the next couple of weeks what's some um, skeptical science covering well, firstly, getting back to that predictions question, um, my prediction is Queensland will win the state of origin next week, <laughs> and and Australia will win the first test in the Ashes unless the extreme weather rains out the the cricket. You're not following. I following think the Lions might give Australia a hard time too. Yeah, I was going to say you're not following the Lions at all. Ah, uh, that's rugby. I don't. It's a it's a rubbish sport. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. SkepticalScience.com is where John Cook hangs out. And we've already mentioned hot-topic.co.nz, uh, where Gareth is, and also uh, the, climate show, the climate show as well with all the show notes. And um, go along and check out all everything we've been talking about there. And, and good to see you in almost HD there as well, Gareth. <laughs> yeah, well, that comes from having a an internet connection that is slightly slower than, oh, well, no, slightly faster than the treacle I have at the farm. Yeah, indeed. Um, all right. Anything else you want to mention before we um, before we put the uh, put the lid on this one? No, I think just have a great time at Glastonbury. I wish I was there with you because there are. I looked at the list of people playing, and I've too many clashes. I wouldn't know what to go and see at any given time of day. I'll well, you enjoy it, Glenn, and uh, I'll expect to hear all about it when we record the next show. Absolutely. Um, good one. That is the Climate Show, episode number thirty-four. Thanks very much for tuning in. We'll catch you next time. See you.